So good evening. Uh, I'm Tim O'Shea, Principal and Vice-Chancellor of the University. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you to the magnificent McEwen Hall to hear Sir John Beddington uh, deliver his Enlightenment Lecture. Uh, the University of Edinburgh Enlightenment Lectures are designed to allow global leaders to examine the Enlightenment's legacy in the context of our times. It's part of a series of public lectures on our changing world, a major public engagement exercise which is celebrating its fifth year. If you're interested in knowing more, there are all 45 lectures from the series over the past five years are available to view online. In the series, distinguished academics have discussed many of the global challenges that face society, including anti development of antibiotic resistance, air pollution and health, behavioral economics, climate change, and food security. Um, as you would expect, we've also heard quite a lot about Scotland and the United Kingdom uh, after the Scottish referendum. The lectures have highlighted the importance of interdisciplinary research and scholarship in meeting these global challenges and also pointed to the excellent uh, research taking place here at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, one thing that's very special about the Changing World Lectures is that they're the basis of an interdisciplinary course for first year undergraduate students and I'm delighted uh, that the class is here this evening. And that introduces them to global challenges and the role of university research. This course is part of the university's uh, aim to enhance sustainability and global awareness in our teaching. Uh, we are indebted to Professor Gareth Leng and uh, Manak Ducha in the School of Biomedical Sciences who have put together the Changing World Lecture Series with support from the university's global academies and from the Department of Social Responsibility and Sustainability. It's an enormous pleasure to tell you a bit about uh, this evening's speaker, Sir John Bellington. Uh, John had an, has had an illustrious and uh, a powerful academic career as a scientist and a scientific leader. He graduated from here in 1973 with a PhD in population biology, uh, returned here to get an honorary degree, um, but after his PhD was a research assistant and has worked in a number of other leading universities. In 2008, Sir John was appointed by the Prime Minister Gordon Brown to the position of Government Chief Scientific Advisor and Head of the Government Office for Science. He chaired the National Security Council Science Advisory Group and the Science Advisory Group in Emergencies. And I've no idea why he looks so calm and content because uh, while he was in office, he had to organize the, the British response to the pandemic influenza outbreak in 2009 the volcanic ash closure of UK airspace in 2010, and the problems linked to the earthquake and tsunami affecting nuclear plants in Fukushima in Japan in 2011. I mean, any of those would have put me off my stride and uh, John sailed through all, all, all three comfortably. He also directed the Foresight team, which has the modest task of looking at the implications of major challenges for up to 40 years from now. He co-chaired uh, with Dame Nancy Roswell, uh, the Prime Minister's Council for Science and Technology. And under his leadership, the Government Office of Science provided some key reports on the future of identity, on international dimensions of climate change, on computer trading in financial markets, and on global food and farming future. And interesting one for us, uh, this is one I'm still working on. He, uh, they produced a report on how academia and government can work together. So I'm going to listen very carefully because I really would like to know how to do that. Um, since ending his term as uh, government chief scientific advisor in 2013, he's taken on a portfolio of appointments. He's spending two days a week as senior advisor to the Oxford Martin School. We're absolutely delighted that he's chair of the University of Edinburgh's Global Academies Advisory Board and giving very wise advice uh, to those four academies. He's had lots of recognition. The Heidelberg Award for Environmental Excellence in 97, election as a Fellow of the Royal Society in 2001, Companion of the Order of St. Michael and St. George in 2004, and the Knighthood in 2010. And in July this year, he was recognized uh, by the Government of Japan for his contributions to strengthening co cooperation between Japan and UK. 
Uh, so it's a great pleasure and a great privilege uh, to introduce the 2015 uh, University Enlightenment Lecture uh, in which Sir John will discuss legacies of the 20th century and challenges of the 21st. Please welcome him. Well, uh, thank you, Tim. Um, uh, I'm never very good at uh, avoiding blushing when people give a panegyric like that, but I do try, you know. Um, one of the, I, I've had this, the privilege of being the government chief scientific advisor, and it's a kind of an odd job because your reporting line is kind of strange in the sense that you report directly to the prime minister and your manager is the, um, is the cabinet secretary. Now, what does that mean? What it means is you can do anything you want because the Prime Minister is not looking at his watch and saying, what on earth is Beddington doing on Wednesday afternoon? And the Cabinet Secretary is saying, did you notice that Beddington had a second glass of wine the other night? Um, so you can kind of do what you like. So it gives you enormous freedom in terms of those practical methods, but it also gives you a lot of freedom to think. And one of the sort of delights of being in the job is being you do get the chance to meet lots of very clever people, and they kind of answer your questions, and that's rather nice. And so um, it was a very great privilege to do it. What I'm going to talk about tonight is sort of some of the reflections that I've had that I have had over the last few years. And I'm, uh, first of all, let me set your minds at rest. I am not a fan of Fidel Castro, so do not expect a three-hour lecture. Um, I shall try and keep re reasonably well to time. But let me just start in here. That's me. You know it already. Um, so I will, not, I will go f straight in. And when I, I was born in 1945, and let's just think about the state of the world in 1950. And I, you know, I, I, you know, I know you can all read things, but no idea what DNA was. Nobody really used antibiotics. Serious threats from infectious diseases. No um, international coordination, coordination for science, really. Very, very prim primitive computers. This is the sort of picture of one on the Scientific American in 1950. And other things like um, no contraceptive pill, no space travel, no satellites. So that was the world when I was five. Um, the acute amongst you can therefore work out how old I am now, and I think I'm looking quite well on it, really. Um, so the, um, after the, so in 1950, that's happened. Then let's think about the latter half of the 20th century. And lots of things happened. First, you know, there was major increase in scientific uh, discoveries. There was disease and poverty alleviation, and I'll come down to some very substantial population growth, large problems of over-exploitation of our natural resources, ecosystem de degeneration, and of course, greenhouse gas emissions. But things are, in, just focus a little bit on technological things, for example. This is, you know, the early computers, and you pr perhaps have seen the um, this film about Alan Turing recently, but the amount of power that has actually developed in the sort of 50 or 60 years since f computers were first invented is quite extraordinary, and I'll come back to that a little bit. But we've moved, to, we've moved on, so enormous technological progress. And it's not just in the high-tech industries, very major progress in agronomy and in agriculture. The, um, the graph shows the increase in the yield of wheat um, that was seen from about 1950 onwards. And this was when you really had some science going into agriculture. And the little pictures are, sh are showing things like what is the, the um, Rothamsted Experimental Station, which is the oldest agricultural station in the world, and they've had test plots since 1850. Rather impressive. So the other thing that's happening is that we really did start to begin to understand biology probably for the first time. And the first, obviously, everyone is aware that the double helix structure was sort of developed and assessed by Watson and Crick. But the graph shows the way in which our ability to understand the, ge the genome, whether of humans, plants, or animals, is increasing and continuing to increase. increase. And so, between 90, 1995 and 2014, 108 to 80 genomes were sequenced, and there are, that is just continuing. 
So we are getting a lot more knowledgeable about the natural world. Um, we're also, in, again, focusing on the tail end of the 20th century, we are getting slightly wealthier. This is the, um, you know, the top left-hand slide shows the, um, the gross domestic product per person um, over the, the period concerned, and as you can see, rising substantially. The slightly more complicated graph shows the distribution of income that occurred again in the last five decades of the 20th century. And what it shows is really a massive increase in what we would ter term middle classes. And I will, I'll come back to that in a minute. But other things were happening too. Marvelous things in a sense that medicine, modern medicine and human health had uh, an enormous effect in reducing mortality both in adults but also in children. And these statistics, and I don't expect you to sort of memorize them, so students here don't feel this is going to be an exam question because you can't be able to read it. But the trend is very clear. The mortality rates, both of adults and children, have declined substantially. And that's a marvelous achievement. But it's got a consequence, and that consequence is very, very substantial population growth. You know, it's simple. If fewer people are dying and the same number of people are being born, you get population growth. So to give you a bit of a, a personal flavor of this, there were two billion people on Earth when I was born. Uh, by the end of the 20th century, that had risen to six billion. And um, no causal mechanism or anything like that involved, but um, I, it, was, uh, it is a dramatic increase. And there's obviously a consequence of that very, very large increase in population is the increase in, in world fossil fuel consumption. I'll come back to that. But also things to do with the resources of, you know, the major resources of water and food and so on. Um, but so the consequence of that population growth has been a big increase in, uh, in natural resources. And it's actually had some really quite dire consequences. For example, big issues of land use change. You know, there's various bullet points that I could point to. But I think the one that I would really emphasize is that about 23% of our, what we might term usable land, whether for livestock or crops, is now degraded to a level you can't really use it. And that we have also, we've seen at the same time, major expansion of where crops are grown throughout throughout the world now, and the, the bottom map shows, shows the sort of patterns that you've actually seen. Um, and also, of course, the issues, their consequences, the, inc the very substantial growth in, pop growth in the uh, world economies has meant, and the increasing prosperity, meant that people were using more energy, and they were using more energy, which is driven almost entirely in the last century by fossil fuels, showing a big emission, an increase in carbon dioxide emissions. And actually, if one sort of tries to think about to, um, the, the rest of the world which we share, um, major issues to do with, ex with extinctions of animal and plant species, major issues to do with the, um, with the control and reduction of forest cover, and indeed in seas, the, the sort of two graphs, the seas show, the top graph of the world map on the right-hand side shows the sort of level of exploitation of the seas that were occurring in the 1950s, a lot in northern Europe, a lot in the eastern seaboard of the USA. But look at the, the subsequent map, which is, which is uh, just five years into the 21st fifth cent, first century, enormous expansion of fishing so that we aren't looking at. And in really important questions about whether these sorts of changes are going to be sustainable, certainly not forever. So let me sum up a couple of things that what has actually happened? What has the 20th century left us? And these, I suppose, are legacies. Now, let me just talk, go to the top graph here, which is a little busy. But what this graph shows is the enormous inequality that is actually occurring in a whole series of countries um, in the developing world, particularly Africa. And what it points to, this is a, a graph of what we call the BMI index, which is an index, really, of fatness and thinness. Um, the, uh, and what that shows is that 
a very large proportion of people, are, of women, have a BMI index of less than 18, which means they're pretty much starving. But actually, almost the same sort of proportions are people who have a BMI index of over 30, 33, which is essentially you are seriously obese with, that, with an effect of your health. And what is so startling about that, of course, is that they, it's the same countries. So there are, people, there are people who are obese and people who are starving in many, many parts of the world. And, to, you know, I, it's hard for you to read the, this graph from the back there, so my apologies for that. But that's one of the sort of consequences, massive inequality. Um, I've already s put, talked about increases um, in, in uh, greenhouse gas emissions and also the pressures on natural and physical resources. But another thing that's happened, again, at the tail end of the 20th century is an enormous increase in knowledge. The little graph with the red line in shows the number of publications of, in scientific pub and, and, and engineering publications that has occurred during that period. So that's the legacy. Now, what's going to happen in the 21st century? Reasonable question. And of course there's uncertainty, but the point I want to make here is that in very key ways, the 21st century is pretty much determined. We're in 2014 now, so it's been running 14 years, and what are happened, some of the things, are absolutely inexorable. First of all, population increase. 11 years away in the future, there'll be another billion people on the planet. That's going to happen. It's not, you know, one can speculate about diseases or pandemics, but short of some enormous nuclear war, you are not going to slow that population increase. The, the worst pandemic that occurred was, at, was after the First World War, the so-called Spanish flu pandemic, killed about 150 50 million people, but the increment on population at the moment is 60 million a year. It won't make a dent, so population is gonna go up. The second thing that's absolutely inexorable is urbanization. Um, essentially, the rural population and the, um, and the urban were equal in about 2010, and that's projected. So there's going to be much more, um, uh, much more urban environment and important, and that's got lots of consequences, which we'll come to in a moment, and climate change. And I shall come back to this, but basically, climate change is, is going on, and it will continue. And it will continue not because governments have failed to address it, though that is part, but it will continue because there's a fundamental time lag in the climate system. So the weather that we are seeing now has been determined by essentially the, the greenhouse gases that were in the atmosphere in the 1990s. I'll come back to that in a little more detail later on. So let me just go to global population. Simple, simple slide here. Um, we're going to have, you know, um, 2011, there were 7 billion people on the planet. Um, by 2025, it'll be 8 billion. But the distribution of that is very, dis is very skewed. Give or take, it's 500 million extra Africans and 500 million Asians. And the effect in Africa is quite startling because the current population of Africa is about a billion. So in 14 years, from 2011, that will go up by 50%. Asia will go up by 500 million, but there's already 4 billion people in Asia, so the proportional change is quite modest. And that is happening. And it is, again, I would say it, it I will come back to this beyond 2025, but all the dem demographic pr projections point to that. Then urbanization, this is the projection into 2025. Um, and this is where the, the large conurbations are expected to be. Um, and again, they're already happening. And let me just focus a little bit back on Africa, because all the projections are saying that that 500 million people will be living in the urban environment, both by um, natural growth of people in urban environments, but also migration from the rural hinterland. Put it in a parochial way, those cities are going to be about... Um, 500,000, so you're talking about, not far from the population of Edinburgh, so you're talking in 14 years' time, 11 years till 2025, 1,000 cities the size of Edinburgh in Africa. This is the scale 
of the changes that are actually happening. And we can't stop it, really. I suppose, um, this is going to happen, whatever we do. And there's other things which are sort of better, in a sense. Um, the bottom slide, and again, this is slightly busy, for which, for my, for which I apologize, but this shows the improvement in bringing, uh, the bottom one with these series of circles, shows the bringing, how people are bringing, being brought out of, object, of poverty. Long way to go, there's still very, very poor people, give or take about a billion people, go to bed hungry every night. Um, and that is a, sh is a scandal on the world community. But also things are happening in terms of the rise of the, what we might very loosely term middle class. Now, giving you some quick figures, there's about a billion people in the developing world who might be called middle class, you know, classified according to, um, <clears throat> to various World Bank standards. That's increasing by 100 million a year. So the number of middle class people is set to double in 10 years, from a billion to two billion. And of course, the consequences are enormous effect of demand on our world's natural resources. And about oh, five or six years ago, I coined the phrase, um, the perfect storm, pointing out that these drivers of increasing prosperity, increasing population growth, increasing urbanization would mean that we were, as we move towards 2030, that energy, you need about 50% more energy, 40 or so percent or so more food, and about 40 or 50% more water. Now, you know, spurious accuracy, it's obviously not that. It might be 38.7 rather than 40, or might 40.2 rather than uh, that. But those are the pickers. And this is the, what I've, the reason I've pointed this out and called it the perfect storm is all these things are happening plus climate change. So the dilemma, and I call it the perfect storm, was that we have got to address these, these security issues of food, water, and energy. And at the same time, we have the problem of mitigating and adapting to climate change. So these are, the, that's in this, you know, I made this speech five years ago, and I think that the, nothing much has changed. So let me, why do we have to worry about it? You know, why are we worrying about climate change? Well, let's think about natural disasters. It's a quite a complicated slide, but the red things on the right-hand side, which are sort of quite lumpy, and the y-axis is, is years, um, going back for a substantial period, it shows that earthquakes and tsunamis haven't really increased in frequency. They've always been there. This is, part, this is God's plan for the universe, that there will be um, earthquakes and tsunamis and indeed volca volcanic eruptions. That's the sort of disasters, and there's no real trend, as I think you can see. Possibly a little bit of trend in terms of um, earthquakes, but it's probably more to do with the fact that we're building more um, cities and human settlements in the area where, which is vulnerable. But look at the other ones. You're thinking about temperature changes, heat waves, cold spells, droughts, um, issues to do with... Um, uh, coldness, tropical storms, all of these things are weather related and therefore climate driven. And that enormous change um, that you see over the, over the previous thousand, hundred years or so is something that has not been documented by scientists. Um, there's a sort of, as it were, those who have Form, are sometimes called climate skeptics, have an argument that, well, all these scientists would say this, wouldn't they? Because they will have a chance to be promoted in their university or get more research grants or so on. Well, actually, this has not been done by scientists. This has been done by the major insurance industries. So this is, um, to the extent that one can say it, it is arguably unbiased because they, they really want to have it. Now, I talked about time delays, and let me just show you, and I, I'm, I'm not very good at these mixed slides, so f bear with me, but this is, the, um, this is the number of natural disasters recorded by Munich Re, which is one of the largest reinsurance companies in the world, and this is worldwide. And those are the disasters, and you can see them going up to 2013, so over a 33-year period. That's how disasters have gone up, and you can see that they're going up, and these are climate-related or weather-related disasters. And at the same time, what you've got is the increase in carbon dioxide, of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, pretty much correlated. But the issue is the time delay. 
So what was the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere in the early 80s were, the, were, the, were driving a climate and a weather systems which were actually causing this big increase in natural disasters. And we therefore have to ask the question, what is it like? Because since the, you know, we are now in the 2011, and we know what the accumulated greenhouse gases in the atmosphere are, and they're going up, and so what can we expect? We've got to expect increased, um, increasing frequency of weather-related disasters, and I think only an observation of the last year or two would point to that. And the worry, of course, is that the projections of greenhouse gases are shown in that red slide, which is the projections made by the international community, the IPCC, on what are their most optimistic and most pessimistic patterns of greenhouse gas emissions. You, just don't, you don't have to be a mathematician to see what that is likely to imply is an increasing frequency of disasters that are driven by the weather, which itself is driven by the climate. Just to illustrate this with a sort of dark little thought, um, just look at the sort of problems that happened in America last year, 2013-14. The pictures speak to it. Wildfires in California have gone, increased by a factor of three over the historical average in 2014. That the snow cover over the Sierra Nevadas um, declined mass massively. But just look at the bottom right, um, the right graph. And that shows the last 150 years, sorry, the last 100 years of uh, weather in the US, in, um, in California. And the black line in the middle shows the average. The, the blue line at the top shows the wettest period. And the red line at the bottom shows the driest period. And this is a 100-year average. So there's vast numbers of that. But look at the little purple line which is actually showing what happened last year. And it's below, substantially below, the average of the previous 100 years or the last 50. Now, that's America, who cares? But the, uh, this is the sort of problem why we have got to take these things seriously. And unfortunately, the political process is really failing at the moment. You know, the IPCC, the Com Conference of the Parties, have met in, in, in Copenhagen, in Mexico, in Doha, and they are going to be meeting in Paris very shortly. There's some hope, reason for hope in Paris. A couple of things I'd point out is there's some um, input going in for clean energy financing. Um, and there's a, there was a deal um, announced about 10 days ago um, between the US and China, in which the US agreed that it would cut its emissions, and China promised that its emissions would peak in 2030. Now, there's a lot of... Re Why has this failed? You know, it's the sort of natural question that one can reasonably ask the political process, and part of it is trying to reach international agreements. Now, the left-hand slide, and this is a poor slide, it's not been marked, but that, the left-hand slide shows in green the number of countries that were, sorry, the number of um, NGOs, as it were, pressure groups that attended the 1992 summit in Rio. And the blue shows the, um, the number of sort of participants there. And you've got Rio in blue and Rio plus 20 in, in um, 2012. So the number of governments increased from 172 to 188 but the number of pressure groups and special interest groups increased from, whether they be, as it were, Greenpeace, who are very who are push in one direction, or whether they be the, the, the hydrocarbon industry pushing in another, those pressure groups have gone up from 2,400 to 9,800. 9, 9, Enormous political pressure. And the idea that one could get agreement from 180 odd countries on some degree of consensus asks a lot. So I confess I'm not optimistic. Let me move on. I talked about the energy requirements of the world and the demand for primary energy is expected to increase by about 30% by 2030. And most of that will come from developing countries, from emerging economies. The expect expectation 
you know, of that is that that primary energy will come in the sort of pattern we're showing there. It's oil, um, oil, coal, gas, and, by, and um, renewables. Now, one of the reasons I'm quite startled and pessimistic about that is this is the expected increase in coal-fired power stations. Now, it's slightly complicated, but the little hatching in red shows the amount of increase in coal-fired power stations which would be compatible with the aim of the international community to restrict climate change to two degrees, so a two degrees increase in the world climate. That's the hatching. The blue points to the, the, blue points to the power stations that have already been built, and the gray, or pale blue, points to the ones that are actually planned. It's very hard to be anything than deeply pessimistic about the potential that we have to, to address this issue. And how are we going to do it? Don't know. Now, there's some things. For example, you know, a lot of talk about shale gas, a lot of course about shale. The, uh, the left-hand um, area um, satellite photograph shows um, light um, in the light emissions from the American Eastern Seaboard. And there's two I've circul circled there. I've showed Minneapolis and Dallas, um, but I've also circled two areas of shale gas production. And they're producing as much light as major cities on the uh, Eastern Seaboard. This is a picture from NASA, the space. Um, and at the same time, um, the reason they're, they're showing light is they're burning the gas. They have no interest in it because the focus of economically now is on oil. And the effect of the increase in oil, uh, in oil production in the USA is really hard to overestimate. It's brought a, a reduction in oil price worldwide from about 105 dollars a ton to about 80. Now, the other two, two points I'd make here are that in an irony, uh, climate change means that the Arctic gets warmer quicker than anywhere else in the world, really. Um, and so we're seeing big changes in sea ice cover in the Arctic and indeed big discoveries of hydrocarbons in that area. And that it's going to be the next major rush for that. And coal reserves, again, all of these are there. They're massive coal reserves. But if we use them, they're extremely dirty in terms of carbon dioxide, but also in terms of their production. Now, it's not impossible to use these, uh, these resources, but you do need to be thinking about some way of using them so you don't produce greenhouse gases. And there are uh, possibilities for clean energy. The little box at the bottom shows, the, shows carbon capture, which is actually taking carbon dioxide from power stations, liquefying it, and putting it into oil and gas reservoirs that have been emptied. And there's real potential for this. It's not worldwide, and the scale needs to be it. And of course, there are other things there. There's good potential for solar, for nuclear, and for wind energy. All of these, but they are tiny compared with the way that hydrocarbons are answering the question. But there's cause for hope. This is the solar, um, the cost of solar photovoltaics is, be, is been de declining really quite dramatically in the last 20 years, and it's starting to become competitive, and new technology is likely to do it. So there's some cause for hope, but there is a real need to be thinking at lots of different levels. Now, the next slide I, I'm going to show you points to a real difference in the way we develop our cities. Now, the thing on the, this is a comparison between two cities which have about the same population. Barcelona has 2.8 million, uh, Atlanta has 2.5 million. The map shows the, the, the level of, of, of uh, essentially the spread of housing and, and uh, industry around Atlanta. And the one on the right shows Barcelona. So the size of Barcelona is about 160 he he um, hectares. Atlanta is 4,800. And the, the greenhouse gas uses of energy, and sorry, the carbon emissions, are 0.7 per capita in Barcelona and a factor of 10 in Atlanta. We've got to think about these things. We've got to think not just at the level of, isn't it awful? 
Um, what we need to be thinking about, about urban planning, remember a thousand cities the size of Edinburgh going to be built in the next 12, 15 years in Africa. Similar sorts of figures, incidentally, for Asia. So there's a lot to be made, to be played for here if one thinks of incorporating urban planning properly and addressing the issues of greenhouse gas emissions. And it's not just that, but cities need to be concentrated on. And this is a, a, some analysis that is done by the OECD, it's looking at the way that urban pollution, massive as we all know in China, but in large parts of Asia, is actually having an effect, not just on pollution-related mortality, but on top of, but in terms of GDP. So that's, that's climate, that's energy. Let me talk to water. And the water, I confess, is the one that really frightens me. Because look at the very top graph. That shows essentially what the demand for water is going to be, driven by population growth, urbanization, uh, prosperity, and what the supply is. And it's about a, as you move out to 2030, there's about a 60% gap in, in supply and demand of water projected to happen. And they don't make much more, so we really need to be thinking about it. Now, if you look at the second slide, the second histogram, agriculture is dominant here. It's the major user of water. Um, the sort of um, agriculture that's doing it in Saudi Arabia w is probably not sustainable, one might think, um, given that you're using vast amounts of energy to generate it. But I showed a picture of a problem in, that, happened, that is current in India is that the aquifers that are, are being subsidized, their exploitation is subsidized by the Indian government. Now, to give you a flavor for that, the age of the water that is being used for irrigation is about 300 years. So it's not exactly a renewable resource going there, and real problems. But also, you need to be thinking about the interaction. The energy sector is dramatic accounts for about 15% of global water use. So I'm, I'm going relatively quickly through this particular slide because I'm going to run out of time otherwise. So big issues to do with water use, whether in, agri whether in um, China's. But at the same time, it's not just water as a security problem. We've got world food. There's real issues to do with demand for food. We need to have as the, something like 40% more food. The, the, the uh, graph shows that breakdown. And in terms of the types of food, whether it's dairy or tubers or basic cereals. And there's a nice little illustration of we have been, as I've referred to in the 20th century, um, very successful in increasing agricultural productivity. It's gone up and up. That shows it for wheat and maize. But the sort of level it's got to go up to to meet the demand that's going to be there as we move into the middle of the century is just dramatic. And Agriculture also produces lots of the greenhouse gas emissions. 24% of, our, of um, our greenhouse gas emissions are currently produced by agriculture, both in terms, apart from the clearing and land use change, but also in terms of, em, em, of emissions, both by livestock, but also by the development of fertilizers. So it's a problem, and it's all linked. And that, in a sense, was the message of my perfect storm speech, was that you can't think about agriculture without thinking about water and energy. You can't think about water without thinking about agriculture and energy, and you can't think about energy without it. These things are fundamentally linked. Now, the things you can do in agriculture, there's some nice things. For example, the uh, system of rice in intensification, which has been developed in Southeast Asia, primarily in Vietnam, has got an enormous effect. So the agronomist and the agriculturalist are doing a good job. And there's also some slightly odd things, is that, um, that we don't really use um, all the plant material that's out there to use. 80% of, of plants consumed come from 12 species. Now, there's something of the order of 30,000 species that are edible and 7,000 species which are semi-domesticated. Where does the research money go? It goes into those 12. Lots of scope for actually thinking about it. And I refer to the fact that we, we know so much more. I talked to the, our ability to look at DNA and sequence it. And this, for example, you know, so there's a real issue of um, 
the potential of using biotechnology to improve wheat, wheat and the cereals, but also some of these underutilized species. And to an extent, society is, has changed a lot. It's much more ready to accept new technology. So this is a graph showing the, the technology adoption of where 25% of American population have it. Well, electricity is going back, but that took 46 years for 25% 25, 25 of the USA to start using it. And if you go to the web, it took seven years to have completely ubiquitous use of the, of the web and all the various things in between, between telephones, radio, television, and so on. So there's a potential here in technology, and also the technology, particularly in computing, is getting better and better. So first of all, there's enormous issues that we can do data for. There's massive ability to actually use satellite sensors to actually estimate what's happening, whether it's in the urban, rural, or ocean environment. And actually in social areas, um, survey data has increased by a factor of four just since 2010. So we're learning much more. And computing power, the illustration is of, of the new um, Met Office computer, costs about 100 million pounds, but it's actually can do 16,000 trillion calculations per second. It's, you know, nobody can think about that. You know, I'm, I'm pretty good at mental arithmetic, but I'm not, I'm not in that league. That, so that's the sort of computing power, so we can think about it, and our next generation weather and climate models should be able to uh, provide weather forecasts not at the sort of um, Michael Fish hand-waving, we may or may not get a big storm, but actually in terms of uh, accuracy of about 300 meters. That's 10 years away at least. But also there's big issues to do with data. So for example, the global mobile tra traffic, which is generating data the whole time. That's the sort of exponential growth over the period from 2012 to 2017. And many of you will know issues to do with the use of mobile telephones as a, bank, as a substitute banking system, which has done a lot of good in, the, in Africa, as people who had no potential to actually transfer and use money uh, and deal with markets have, got a, have, have been able to do so. Now, what a, it's a funny mixed picture. In a sense, one can be excited by, this, by science and think it's science may be able to solve it, but the problems are quite phenomenal. They are phenomenally large, and also there's complications. So this, for example, is, um, is a picture which shows the number of people in the world with a little circle showing where half the people, the world's population, live, and that was last year. But remember the points I was making about population growth. That population growth is not going to be in the OECD. So 2030, the number of people of working age in Europe will be half that of Africa, and a tenth of what it will be in, in Asia. That's going to make a bit of a difference to the world we live in, and it's simple demography, and that's not going to change. So this is something we've got to address. It's a complication, but it does mean that we have got to have political processes that actually address these sorts of changes. And of course, we all read about the rise of China and with a 10-year lab, the increase of India where, give or take, um, something be, uh, over a third of the world's population live now and will be, will be living in the future. Now, those are the sort of issues that create a challenge. And there's one legacy of the 20th century that is, re that I find, more depressing than anything. And that's a personal view. It's essentially a reaction to what was terrible agricultural practice. You're all known of um, the Silent Spring, Rachel Carson's book, which pointed to the way in which modern agriculture and modern industry was wiping out large numbers of species, but also seriously eroding um, the, our, our capacity, whether it's in land and forests. And that's important. But it's, what it's produced is an, what you might very loosely call a green community who are fundamentally against some of these issues. Now, the European Commission and the European community as a whole 
um, is particularly sensitive to this. So um, they, for example, um, are, have regulated pesticides quite substantially. But actually, there's some real t potential downside here that if you regulate pesticides, you're going to lose crops. You're going to lose a proportion of your crops. And the bold line there points to the fact that simple bans, on, in this case on neonicotinoid insecticides, which were done because um, people claimed that they affected pollinators and bees in particular, that was brought in by the European Parliament and it's now law. But evidence, well, study recently published in the, um, in, the Royal, in the proceedings of the Royal Society pointed out actually they're not implicated. That no geographical correlation between their use, um, honeybee decline began prior to the use of these insecticides. And that the you know, issues to do with the experiments which say that these are terrible, um, tended to have levels of dosage that were way off the scale that would actually happen. That's, that's the pesticide. But the other one is ge genetically modified organisms. The use of biotechnology to, um, to actually address the manipulation of the genes of species. Now, the, this is happening throughout the world, um, uh, but there is very, very stringent um, <coughs> regulations on GMOs, but they are, have a potential, for example, to be resistant to infectious diseases. You can develop those that are drought resistant. You can those, develop those that have less demand for pesticides. Now, there's been some studies here on the evidence base. For example, the UK Council for Science and Technology, which is the main um, uh, committee that reports to the Prime Minister, pointed out that they're now making up 12% of global arable land, and they have no evidence has been found at all, though it's been looked for very carefully, um, of any environmental effect. There's a sort of slightly odd argument um, pointing out that there's been no lawsuits in the USA. Now, the USA is probably um, the most litigious society that you've ever seen since, I suppose, Seneca's Rome or something like that. Um, <coughs> but there's no lawsuits. Nobody has sued anybody about GM technology in the USA. And there's something like 13 trillion meals have been, out, been eaten since that was involved. Doesn't prove it, but it's pretty, pretty imp important. And the European Academ Academ Academies, Science Advisory Council, which is all the science academies in Europe, has said there's no rational basis for the stringent regulation of GM organisms. None in terms of science. Now, <laughs> Let's now to go to the politics. This is President Juncker, <coughs> who said that the majority view of the democratically elected governments should prevail over the scientific advice on the regulation. Interesting statement. Ignore the science, politics will dominate. And the NGO community, the very community that one would look to for, in a sense, supporting evidence, have written, wrote to Juncker um, about three months ago, asking him to not only to sack his chief scientific advisor, um, but actually to abolish the post. Well, what's happened? Well, Anne Glover, who used to be the chief scientific advisor in Scotland, has been fired. Um, the position has been um, ab um, abolished. And as Paul Nurse, who is Nobel laureate and president of the Royal Society, points to the issue of how, in a sense, the European community and the Commission are eroding the basis of evidence into policy. In a sense, they're moving to policy into evidence. And that is extraordinarily dangerous. Now, let me just point, compare and contrast senior politicians like Mr. Juncker with those in the USA. And I'll read this because I, this is President Obama saying it's about listening to what scientists tell us even when it's inconvenient, especially when it's inconvenient. Hard to imagine Mr. Juncker saying that. And then Stephen Chu, um, when dealing with some of the skeptics uh, on many sides, pointed out that people are entitled to their own opinions, but they're not entitled to their own facts. Um, a great quote. I wish I'd said it, but he's got better speech writers, writers than me. And I'll, I'll keep saying it anyway, you know, I will attribute it. 
So those are the sort of dilemmas that we're actually having. And, I, you know, I'm, I, I would say this, wouldn't I? I'm firmly in, of the belief that we've got to get objective science. We've got to get objective science going up to, um, to go into the political process. And to erode that is extraordinarily dangerous. So what are the challenges then? Let me sum up. What are the challenges up to 2030? Now, I'm excited. I can think about 2030. I find it virtually impossible to get excited about 2050 because in 2050, I'll be 105. Um, 2030, well, you can, 20 years off, I might just be going moderately strong. But these are the challenges. We've got a billion more people, big urbanization, I'm repeating myself, big issues in terms of the strain on resources, big issues of climate change, and summing it up in, that, um, in the little table at the bo bottom is that we need, give or take, 40% more food, 40% more water. And if um, we do not regulate energy, we're going to see about, um, we need about 50% more energy. And if we don't do anything, emissions have got by about 37% over that period. That's by 2030. Now, you recall the time delays. If we get increasing greenhouse gas emissions up to 2030, that will deter the weather to 2050 because of that time delay. So we've got to think about it. So I'm coming to everybody get the first thing to say about it. Normally, when I give a speech, I try to do it in the early evening so people can go for a drink afterwards because everybody's so miserable and depressed. Well, this is a nice environment to do it, you know. And uh, my limited experience as a PhD student is that this is not entirely out of keeping with the Edinburgh culture. But, but what about after 2030? And there's two points I want to make here. First of all, the greenhouse gas emissions, and I've talked to that. But we're now in 2050, 2014, almost at 2015. We've got about 15 years to cut back on greenhouse gas emissions, unless you ha and if you don't, the chances in the blue line, and it's a complicated graph for which I apologize, the blue line shows the sort of way that emissions would have to go, i.e. declining from now on to meet, the, um, to meet a, a target of a two degree increase which is what the international community has set as its target. The orange, or red, um, shows the way it's currently going. So business as usual would do it. So that's going to imply not a two degree increase in temperature, but it'll be four, five. And pretty much all the analysis that one shows says this is not going to be a very um, stable world if you have those things. Now they'll happen, and they will be inexorable because of this time delay. And actually it poses a real political dilemma, which is, if you sort of say to the political world, you must intervene to stop greenhouse gases, um, one, they have a political cycle that is operating on a rather short time scale, five years or something like that. But actually, because of the time delays, even if you intervene and cut greenhouse gases, you're still gonna get terrible weather for 20 years. So it's a very interesting political dilemma, and you would need enormous sort of cross-party support for that. And finally, the, uh, the other one that worries me is global population. Now, the left-hand side points to um, the best bet, as it were, which is the sort of center of the blue shading. And that's the best bet of what population growth is, and that's where I came up with my um, estimate of um, an extra billion by the next few years. Now, notice two things. Notice that once you go out to 2025, irrespective, these graphs tend to go together. But if you had a failure to see a reduction in female fertility, you could be looking out at 10, 11 billion people on Earth by, tw by the tail end of the century. And that is just, it's hard to imagine how that could be sustainable. Now, Interventions, one of the things that we know in terms of fer affecting fertility is, the is um, that fertility declines when prosperity comes in. Um, so there's a natural feedback. If you get more prosperous, you, get, you have, um, people have fewer children. It's also known pretty well that the education of women um, is very highly correlated with fertility also. So that the, more, the longer um, a woman has been to school or had education, the fewer children. 
Um, so there's two mechanisms that are happening. If they're not there, and the p focus on population growth is just an absent, whether it by the aid agencies, it's sort of seen a bit, not a thing you want to get involved in. But if you don't do it, you're going to be seeing it. And the right-hand slide is a recent assessment doing the same thing, but it's pointing to that actually that we probably have underestimated the population growth even on our current projections. So that's post-2030, and those are two things that worry me. So what about 2050? We remember John Beddington's 105, so you, you can't blame him. Uh, um, 2050? Two and a bit billion more people, 70% of the world in urban environments, more prosperous. Big issues of climate change in terms of we can reach tipping points. For example, if we actually have the Arctic warming up by such, to such an extent that the tundra melts, you can see the emission of methane from rotting vegetation, which is a, sort of, which is a, a, um, a, green, a greenhouse gas. And you're going to see all manner of social disruption. The picture of a, a boat that was actually migrating from North Africa into Italy shows the sort of uh, problems that we may expect with that increasing population, increasing disruption of the world. So going out to 2050, well, we need 60% more water, sorry, 60% more food, 55% more water, 80% more energy, and if we don't do anything about emissions, they'll go up by about 50%. That's the challenges out there. And I pointed challenges which are slightly easier before 2030, um, but they're challenges that are really dramatic as we move towards the middle of the century. But I'll end on a, how are we going to address these challenges? Well, I would say this, wouldn't I? I am a scientist. I've been a scientist really closely involved in the development of policy. I firmly believe that, we need, that, that science and engineering, if anything, is going to provide solu potential solutions. It needs political will, it needs investment, but a necessary, if not sufficient, condition of addressing these problems is to have some form as sensible investment in science and technology. I mean, I'll end on the, what I think is quite a nice, a nice quote, and um, I wish some of the European nations would note this, but those nations that invest in science are investing in the future, and those that cut science are hoping for the best. Um, and that's Peter Agre, who's a Nobel laureate at the American Association of the Advancement of Science. So it's a mixed message here. Good things have happened. Great things have happened in terms of human health and human endeavor and the growth of science and technology. But terrible things have happened. And if we don't do something about it, it's, it's not going to get easier. So thank you for your attention. Um, that, was a, <clears throat> that was a great lecture, uh, very clear. We've now got about um, a quarter of an hour for questions. Uh, posing a question, <clears throat> please state <coughs> who you are and, and, and please try to be relatively terse. First questioner, please. The silence on military conflict. Mm. I realize you're a scientist, but the perception of the layperson, the public, in the world is that military conflict is significant. Mm. How significant is it to you as a scientist in terms of collection of data, reliability of such data okay. from governments? Um, I, get the, I get the question. So Assessing the money spent on research and development in military um, acts compared to R&D in scientific uh, technology. Okay, I, I, I understand yeah. the question you're posing me. The first thing to say is that conflict is trivial in terms of demography. The number of people killed in even massive wars has had very little effect. You know, think about the First or Second World War of the order, you know, which was the two most devastating, of the order of five, maybe eight million people were killed. Sixty million is the population increment per annum. So, now, the big exception, of course, is a nuclear conflict, and that could, you know, whatever we do as a species, we've got to stop there being a nuclear warfare. Your question about 
investment in science and technology in terms of uh, um, supporting arms development, weapons, defensive, both defensive and offensive, is, yeah, there is significantly much more money is spent on R&D in that area than there is in, in other areas. And to an extent, that has to be part of the democratic process, doesn't it? You know, if, if people don't want that, they should be voting for different politicians. It's not a thing, I can, as a scientist, I can say. I can say objectively, you know, and the way John Beddington's vote would probably be for, um, you know, let's, let's try to avoid nuclear war, whatever we do. And also let's try to think about some things to do with the development of biological weaponry, because that could be devastating. And that, those are the two worries that I have. Um, but, I, but in terms of the overall spending, the facts are that significantly more is spent on development of weaponry and both offensive and defensive uh, than there are in R&D in pretty much any field, except, for example, IT. So the next question here. Thank you for your speech. My name is Maximo Sidio. Um, I'm wondering what's the role of education and universities? The role of the what, sorry? Edu education yes. and the universities to tackle uh, these challenges? Yeah. Um, well, knowledge is always better than ignorance, is my view. Mm -hmm. And I think that what we, are, what we are hoping, what we are seeing in a large portion of the developing world is significant in, um, increase in higher education, but also very significant increases in relatively elementary education. The level of literacy in many parts of the developing world has soared. Um, the most successful country probably for this is Brazil, where they've actually had an intervention in which they pay parents to send their children to school. And that has had an enormous effect on, the, uh, on essentially education within Brazil and actually social change. So there's some very good, good areas. I think the, there are some real issues here that, that we probably are not producing enough scientists and engineers, but the latest question about we're probably putting too many into, into the military industrial complex. But we do need um, education. We, and it's not just education. We don't want to just have physicists, engineers, molecular biologists. We need education in the social sciences. We need education in the political sciences. Because, you know, as I say, um, knowledge is uh, rather more important and rather better than ignorance. Um, thank you very much for a fascinating talk. Um, my name is Catherine Pollard. I just graduated from MSc Environmental Politics. Um, and my question was, um, what do you think of the term natural capital? And do you think that's the way forward? Mm. It's an interesting question. The, the idea here is, because many of the people don't know what natural capital is, you've done, just done an MSc, so you've probably written an essay on it. Um, the, I think the issue here is that we need to be thinking about how we value ecosystems, how we value other species. Um, it's actually quite te difficult technically to do it from an economic point of view, but if in fact, for, for example, we said, what about the development of agriculture to um, increase food production? If that's done at the expense of a complete erosion of a forest ecosystem, you need to have both sides of the, equa uh, both sides of the assessment to be addressed. It's quite a it's important, but I don't think it's actually that well done at the moment because it's really hard to think about how you evaluate it. And there's sort of, there's sort of daft ways of doing it, like you ask people who go to a nature reserve how much would they be prepared to pay if they had to go another 10 miles or something like that. So it's a sort of slightly um, uh, dodgy way of estimating it. It's incredibly important, but I actually, I, you know, the, I don't think the methodology is really developed to a level that we can do it. But I think what we can do is actually pose questions about what does this mean? Would we be prepared to intervene? And for example, there's quite a lot of work that's been done on ecosystems and asking what services they provide. For example, let, let's think about flooding, coastal flooding. If one actually has coastal flooding and build big walls to stop it happening, it's rather different and rather more expensive than if you, if you had significant estuarine development where you could actually have natural flooding occurring. So there's, there's things like that. It's an important area, but it's not that well developed yet. But maybe in five years it will.
Hello, my name is James Tulloch. I had a, a website called Open Knowledge, which is actually run by an insurance group. Um, I wondered <coughs> what your thoughts were on um, wastage. Mm -hmm. um, in particular, I'm thinking about the wastage of food yeah. that is prevalent in so many <coughs> of our societies. Mm -hmm. um, my father was in China recently, and he was in a restaurant where they charged an extra 15% service charge if you left 50 grams worth of food. <laughs> um, what, what are your thoughts on the kind of cultural yeah. and behavioral mm. changes that are necessary? It's a very good question. And I, you know, um, forgive me for not c commenting on it in the context of agriculture, but the, the sort of statistics are quite frightening. Give or take, if you think about the developing world, about 30% is lost due to pests and diseases at, uh, before it leaves the farm gate, and another 30% in storage. That's the sort of typical developing world statistic. In, as it were, developed economies, about 50% is thrown away after, after purchase. Now, they're very different phenomena, and, you know, but waste is enormously important, and I think that if we think about the developing world, we need to have ways of affecting both better pest and, pest and disease control, but also, uh, which, which includes storage. In the developed world, how do you change these things? Now, I can think of a few changes, and I was talking with some colleagues here at the university today, but there has been a change of ethos about a number of things. Smoking. Completely unacceptable. Uh, in, you know, if somebody was smoking here, half the people here would sort of bash them and shout at them, telling them to go. I think, so the changes in attitude in the population's attitude to smoking in this country have changed dramatically. I also think, for example, drunken driving. There was, you know, um, I won't go into some sort of hideous biography, but I certainly, when I was a PhD student here, I certainly had more than one glass of beer before I got behind the car to drive to where I lived. So there's a complete, there is some changes in the social attitude and there are various interventions. For example, in terms of alcohol consumption, we drink vastly too much with consequences for crime, for, for um, disruption of society, for human health. But governments have shied away from putting a very significant alcohol tax. Now, I, I didn't know about the Chinese example that your uh, father had done, father uh, experienced about that. But I think the interventions in terms of waste both in terms of agro agronomy to address the issues in the developing world and in storage, but also to address them in the developed world. And in a sense, one of the ironies about the, um, some of the statistics I showed to do with um, different countries in the developing world in which give or take 20% of the people are starving and 20% of the people are obese. Very, very curious. And if you think at a worldwide scale, it's a, it's a big problem, but I think it's one of the ones that would really nose focus in. You know, in, in a sense, um, you, the sort of things that you're seeing now is the two-for-one um, offers from supermarkets, which pretty much guarantee a large level of waste. These are sort of, this is, there is pressure on this. It's not, not sufficient yet, but I have some hope that social change will happen. Well, I'd point to essentially alcohol dry, uh, with driving and smoking is two ones where there has been a total change. I would love to see a situation in, outside the agriculture and waste thing, for example, where it would be seen as socially unacceptable to drive a very, very large car for a long, with only one person in it. No, that hasn't happened yet. There's a bit of pressure, there's driving clubs and so on. But I think those are the sort of things that one might hope to see. I think there's a big prob cultural problem, of course, is that what happens in Western Europe, and we are quite diverse, um, as you can see from our views on GM technology, um, what happens here or what happens in India. You know, India diet, for example, is very, very strongly vegetarian. And um, the Chinese diet is moving way up into very, very large proportional consumption of meat, of meat and dairy. Um, if we all live like Indians, it would be an easier task of feeding uh, the world. Good. But good question. Good evening, Sir John. I enjoyed your lecture. My name is John. I'm going to have to come near. I'm sorry, I'm a bit deaf. I enjoyed your lecture, Sir John. Thank you. My name is John Matheson. 
the graph he put up that showed coal, coal reserves, oil reserves, etc., hydro down at the bottom, basically yep. flatlining, how much research is going into and what is the potential of the tidal power given the fact that 70% of the world is ocean? Tidal or coal? Tidal. Tidal, yeah. Um, there is quite a lot of uh, research being done on tidal flows. Um, and it's sort of, in a sense, there's a whole series of potential renewables. You can think about wind power both onshore and offshore. You can think about wave power and you think about tidal. All the analysis I've seen saying that is saying that in terms of the use of um, the seas, right, wa that wave power is nothing like as efficient or as potentially important as tidal. You need to find areas where the where tidal flows will work um, and you need to be thinking about it. There is actually a lot of research is being done on more efficient turbines and so on that actually can capture tidal flows. The UK is a very advantaged in the sense that it's got a number of potential sites for this and another country which has also is Korea, for example, where, there is, where the, the, tog the geography means that you can do it. I think that these are really important and I think that you are going to see it. But when you look at the graphs, the proportion of it that could actually be utilised if you added a Mac, and you can do the simple, almost back of envelope calculations, the one area, the one technology which I do believe could change things in terms of our energy is solar. And there, the, the back of the envelope calculations show that there's enormous potential. And there's a lot of wind, but, you know, I showed the, the photovoltaic price has, has gone down by a factor of 40 in, over the last 30 years and will probably continue. So, and that is one where, as I say, simple back of the envelope calculations say you could do it. So, for example, there's some plan, there's some development of the idea that in North Africa, one, would actually, one could actually have solar farms which could actually export electricity north into Europe. May happen. I think there's very complicated political processes that might be involved in that, but it's not impossible. And I think that you are going to see that develop. I think you're going to see renewables developed a lot, but when you come down to it, you need that base, you need that base load that pr is provided by the current electricity generation using oil, gas or coal, or you need nuclear. And in terms of that, um, you then you have a sort of deeply unfashionable uh, attachment to the anti-nuclear world. One of the jobs I did in government was, as, I, as I Tim mentioned, was I advised the government after the Fukushima disaster. And the basic question was, um, should we evacuate the embassy and should we move all our nationals out? And I, I worked with some of the nuclear people, both in the health side and in the physics side. And we came up with an answer that this is daft. You know, the amount of radiation that I actually could do is, I used, I made a big mistake. I said it was like eating 10 bananas and the banana importing industry has been persecuting me ever since. <laughs> <coughs> but it gives you a sort of flavor. There's an incredible um, exaggeration of the potential toxic effects of radiation. And that is promulgated by some pressure groups. Um, in a sense, the reverse comes from the nuclear industry. But, I, but in fact, some factual development is really important. In fact, and uh, I think that, that we are going to need nuclear. And there's some exciting new ideas. One of the things that has come out of the USA, and I quoted Stephen Chu saying, you know, and people entitle their opinions, not their, their own facts. Um, he developed, he's developed, when he was Secretary of Energy, a whole program looking at small modular nuclear reactors. This is the sort of size of reactor that might be put in a nuclear submarine, but actually you would ha use it for the generation of power in relatively small communities. You could bury it deep, security issues are that less. It costs a hell of a lot less than what the 10 billion, the Henkley Point is going to cost. So there's some interesting questions here. I mean, a very good debate. I'm now going to uh, propose a vote of thanks because Thank we you. really had Sir John working very hard. <clears throat> and I ju just want to say that was an extraordinary lecture. Uh, Sir John took us a starting point mostly 1950. Uh, he took us forward uh, towards the end of the, the current century. He spoke about a wide range of subjects, 
uh, demonstrating both real mastery of uh, a range of technologies, a range of topics in the life sciences and the geological sciences, and at the same time managed uh, to express uh, to us with um, great, great clarity and great, great calmness, some things which are immensely challenging. And I thought the, the whole combination uh, was superb. And as we just saw, in terms of the uh, questions, we had a very heterogeneous set of questions uh, and Sir John was in a position uh, to answer again with, with great clarity and great uh, conciseness. So please join me in thanking him again.